listeners, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I'm here with Liberty Larry. Woohoo! We're back! Yeah. I'm back. You're back. Yeah. Mike's been here. <laughs> Try to keep the energy flowing. Yeah. As it were. The content rolling out. Yeah. You know, you, you missed a couple of weeks and people stopped listening to you for some reason. I don't know why, but. <laughs> and apparently if they're locked at home, they stop listening to you too. Being locked at home sucks, man. Yeah. If we did a uh, video, I think that we would have still been okay. Oh man. If we had, yeah. if we had a YouTube version of the podcast, even yeah. if we did it like Tom Woods and just had like the logo up in the background. Yeah. I think that that probably would have been enough, but maybe not. Uh, people want to watch something, I think, when they're sitting at home doing nothing. Um, audio's for when you're driving or you have it on in the background while you're working or whatever. I mean, that's yeah. what I do. I, yeah. I spend my entire day at the office with earbuds in. Uh, um, I listen when I'm driving. That's the only time I listen to podcasts. Yeah. Driving down the road. Um, well, I used, to ha- I used to do more driving <laughs> at yeah. my office, and I, I don't so much anymore. Um, but... Uh, yeah, I listen to stuff all day. Although I'll also admit that, you know, there there are times during the day when I'm so intent on something that I'm doing that I realize that I've lost like the last 10 minutes or something of whatever I'm listening to. Like, I have <laughs> yeah. no idea what they're talking about now. What happened? Yeah. Yeah, I have to back it up and try again. Yeah. Although I put in some Velvet Underground stuff while I was um, working today, uh-huh. um, which was, you know, reasonable background music. And like, like I've listened to Lou Reed but I realized that I've never actually listened to the Velvet Underground, and that yeah. you're I'm, digging it. Yeah, I am actually. <laughs> I, I was thinking I might order some stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, go old school and order a, a CD that has liner notes and stuff because I dig liner notes. <laughs> I had that conversation with somebody at work the other day. CDs apparently are dead. Like I said something about buying a CD or something. They were like, "What do you mean buy a CD?" I'm like. <laughs> I like to have a hard copy of stuff. Like, well, I guess it's better than what's a CD. Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, this this person wasn't that much younger than me, although she was younger. So who knows? But I don't know. I still like to have the hard copy, man. I like to throw a CD in and listen to it. Me too, yeah. but mostly, I mean, because I do that anyway. If I get something on iTunes or yeah. whatever, and I download it digitally, I can put it on a CD. Yeah. Actually, I can't put it on a CD with this computer because this computer doesn't have a player <laughs> of any kind. All right. I have to use my laptop, but uh, I mean, I can throw it on a flash drive, move it over there. That's actually a lot of steps for making a CD it's these a days. A lot of work, man. It used to not be so hard. No. Uh, um, but I, I like the um, I like the cases with the pictures and the liner notes, and I yeah. like I like that stuff. All the extra, yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, and you'd think the millennials would really dig that because, you know, you get. The story stuff, like they're into stories for their brands and what have you, like stories, an important part of selling to millennials. Now, it seems like they're completely missing out on the music story by just downloading on iTunes and not having it all on your phone. Yeah. I don't even have my phone in here. (laughs) Mine is. It's muted, but it keeps going off. I have a magic phone that always rings. Well, we need to get into it because it is already hot in this room, yeah. and um, it's only going to get worse. So uh, we'll try and keep it reasonably short so that we don't melt in here. <laughs> right. Get even more dehydrated since we're drinking whiskey, too. Oh, it's summer in Alabama, man. Yeah, it truly is. Um, I have some uh, I have some insulation issues, though, which hopefully will soon be fixed. But for the moment... <laughs> it's hot. Yeah, it's warm in here. Although uh, it's actually only like 75 degrees or something like that. But to you and me, that seems really hot, even though we live in South Alabama. That's hot, man. Like the air conditioner at my house stays in the 60s. Well, the, it stays set on the 60s. It don't get that cold, but yeah, <laughs> it continuously runs. Yeah. If I thought I could get it that cold, I would set mine at probably 67. Yeah. That seems like a good number. It's a prime yeah. number. It's 67 like, is about where I leave it set. I, yeah. I turn it up to 70 if I'm leaving. Yeah. Well, I, okay, so I do it a little differently. I take it down to 71 at night because it'll, it'll stop running Yeah, <laughs> at, yeah. Some, at some point if I set it at 71. And 71 is bearable. Yeah. Uh, I'm good with that. And then uh, 73 when I'm home, but I'm not trying to sleep. 
Yeah. Um, and then 75 when I'm away, which is why it's 75 in which here right now. Which is why it's so warm right I now. Because I got home 15 <laughs> minutes ago. Or, or yeah. Now. So, and it just hasn't had time. And it has to fight against that 90-whatever degrees outside and afternoon oh, sun. It's hot, man. Yeah. So, um, I, so we didn't have anything really specific to talk about, but I thought that it might be interesting just to do a little... Um, well, so I heard the Austin, uh, I guess the city councilor, or whatever, um, it, with the with the resurgence of COVID. Oh yeah, such as it is, um, that they had uh, decided on um, a mandatory mask law, and um, they are still considering another thirty five day lockdown. Oh wow. And but either way, they were going to follow it up, and it was man, it was the most arrogant sounding thing I'd ever heard when they were discussing it, that they were going to follow up that 35 day lockdown with a period of lessons learned. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. For the, well, for the people of Austin. That's what irritates me more than anything with this whole situation is, is that statement like right there with lessons learned. Like, and so I was listening to PR on the way here and there's a bunch of that type of language where, oh, well we, we, we need to do better. And, and just, I don't know, like, like, the government acting like it's our parent and we've misbehaved and now we have to be punished. Right. And, and, oh. Yeah, and you get the impression from that that that's what the 35-day lockdown is. Yeah. Oh, well, you won't wear a mask like we told you, so, so. we're just going to lock you back in your homes. We're going to imprison you for another month. Exactly, and that's exactly what it sounds like. And mm-hmm. it's, it's, I'm beginning to, I've always been a bit of a conspiracy theorist, but I'm beginning to think more and more that this is, that's all this is, is just a ploy for government to control people. Yeah. Well, I I think that a part of it is this, um, it's certainly politicized in a huge way uh, on both sides. And I think that the, the primary fallacy that we need to try to express to people is the idea that government can do anything about this. Well... Oh, you make a good, and we've talked about that before on the mm-hmm. podcast. Is that it's a virus? Like, yeah. <laughs> it's gonna do what it's gonna do. Yeah. Like, I mean, and from what I've seen from um, epidemiologists and um, and so forth that are deviating from the main narrative uh, with their data and so forth, is that the statistics would suggest that it doesn't matter what these governments have done; that the virus has progressed like viruses do. Yeah. Period. Well, whether there was a lockdown or no lockdown, whether there were masks or no masks, whether whether it was a dense population or a, a sparse population, that none of that has had much of an impact on the spread of the virus. There's been some differences in mortality rates. Yeah. Um, and, and so there is apparently like, you know, something that could be done to isolate the most um, at risk people um, potentially. Yeah. But even that as a as a um a government mandate i'm opposed to yeah yeah i mean absolutely i mean people have to make their own choices and i thought that we might do a little lessons learned of our own here yeah um starting with all right actually we'll just go ahead and start with the premise that your government can't save you from a virus i'm going to say it over and over and over again now they want to convince you that they can they're going to tell you that everything has gone badly here that the virus has spread and so many people have died and so many people have been infected because Trump's administration did it all wrong. But I can tell you with supreme confidence that it wouldn't have mattered who the president was or what the policies that they enacted were, that it would have done essentially the same thing. Yeah. That it, that the well, government policy would have had very little impact to mitigate and certainly not to control the virus well and when all of this started they i felt like they had a pretty good the premise was in the beginning that you know we need to to flatten the curve and and we don't want to overwhelm the hospitals like and the whole idea of like slowing the pace down so you don't overwhelm the hospitals i wasn't really so much against now Mm -hmm. i was kind of i was very much against the government mandating it yeah but i wasn't so much against the idea of all right we need to see if we can take some steps to spread this out because we don't want to overwhelm the system yeah we're way past that well especially when we didn't know 
how what, dangerous it really was. Well, and that's the that other point. thing, and because, um, like I say, that was that was my biggest concern. Is yeah, overwhelming the hospitals would be a problem, and, mm-hmm. and there wasn't a lot known about the virus and how it spread and this, that, and the other, mm-hmm. and and how deadly it would be. Yeah, um, we know so much more as far as all of that is concerned now. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just it doesn't seem. It's just now it's all about control. Yeah, yeah, uh, I agree. Um, and the at, at this point. Uh, no hospital system in the U.S. has been overwhelmed. There have been some hospital systems that were stressed. Yeah. But no hospital system has been overwhelmed. Yeah. And so I would say that... um, We won. That only in those places... Well, really, (laughs) yeah. um, That only in those places where the hospital system was was stressed did any kind of lockdown have any impact on the results at all. Yeah. Um, because you're right. Uh, there is more of a danger if people can't get medical care. Yeah. That's certainly true. And there's been plenty of people that can't, well, that didn't get medical care, but it's not because the hospitals were overwhelmed. It's because um, the government has so completely screwed up the healthcare system in this country uh, between insurance and the healthcare itself that 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 was the problem. Yeah. Um, well, and I saw some report, I think I talked to you about it last night, the uh, report on some news station, I think it may have been NPR or something, but uh, um, of Yemen, that the um, virus mm-hmm. is just ravaging Yemen right now. But the reason for that is because they can't get any medical care there. Like, I mean, these people are star- literally yeah. starving, and, and they even talk about it in the report that the... When when they interview people, they're not really concerned about the virus. They're concerned about eating that day. Yeah. Like and so yeah, people that are in those type of conditions, it's gonna ravage them. You and know? I'm guessing that they didn't mention anywhere along there that it was the U.S. support of the Saudis that is, has led to this situation. Oh, obviously not. No. I mean, they they talked about. Did trying- they mention that the that there's U.S. ships that are actually enforcing the blockade that's preventing food and medicine from getting into the country? Obviously not. Oh, um, <laughs> but- did they did they mention that it's a uh, U.S. Um, um, uh, fighter jets and bombers and uh, U.S. trained um, pilots and uh, U.S. support crews and uh, U.S. targeting systems that are uh, permitting them to blow up hospitals and irrigation and water supplies and things like that? All of that was conveniently left out of the report I saw. Lots of talk about how it was ravaging, how the coronavirus was ravaging the country. Mm -hmm. And that was really Did they mention the war at all? No, they, they the only <laughs> okay. part that the only thing they really mentioned was um that the organizations that normally come in to help were unable to but they they played that they off. They didn't say that that might be because of the war. No, they said that it was because of <laughs> lack of funding is was what they kept oh, coming up. Oh, against. so you just need to contribute we need mm-hmm. to contribute more money to save the Yemeni from the U.S. backed Saudi <laughs> war. Yeah, that was okay. that was pretty well the angle that was played <laughs> through the report. <laughs> okay, so well, I'm yeah. glad I didn't see that report. My blood pressure might have shot through the roof. <laughs> you may have thrown stuff at the TV. <laughs> <laughs> so. Well, um, the the other thing that I wanted to start with is uh, there was there's a. Um, Disease Prevention Chair at Stanford University oh, yeah. um, here, which is a pretty well-known and respected university. Um, he's got a Greek name. I mean, his last name is Greek. His first name is easy. Um, so I may pronounce this like terribly. We should go by first names in this case. It's Dr. John. So Dr. John, I, I, it's I-O-A-N-N-I-D-I-S. I, I think it's Yanitis, something like that. <laughs> anyway. Um, he said in March or wrote in March, I'm, I'm actually not clear on which is an interview, but I think it was a, uh, an email interview. Oh, wow. Okay. You know, anyway, um, he said, uh, one of the bottom lines is that we don't know how long social distancing measures and lockdowns can be maintained without major consequences to the economy, society, and mental health. Yeah. The la- all of those are important. I, I just want to stress though, that last one is really important. Well, right. we're in luck then because that's the one that I have the most notes on. <laughs> oh, awesome. Well, cool. I'd be interested to hear what you have on that because okay. th- I, that's that's the one I worry about the most. Mm-hmm. It's just not healthy for people to stay in this lockdown mode yeah. for very long. Humans are social animals anyway. And, yeah. um, and there has been study after study after study that suggests that isolation is really bad for uh, psychological health, for Absolutely. mental health. Um, 
So uh, we're going to start. We're going to take them in order, though. We'll start with the economy. Sure. Right? Yeah. So this is our own little lessons learned. Yeah. Um, well, they uh, the U.S. government shut down the economy by force. And it led to 43 million jobs lost Whew. in less than two months. Good night. Um, which is, uh, by the way, three times as many jobs that were lost in two years after um, the last downturn, the the Great Recession. The Great Recession, yeah. yeah. Um, so this is this is unemployment at uh, at Great Depression levels. Yeah. Right. Um, Forty plus forty three million roughly jobs lost. Um, more than a hundred thousand businesses closed. Yeah. That's just oh man. Just makes you sick thinking about it. Yeah, and this is the one that nobody seems to be talking about. And we're gonna we're gonna spend a whole episode on this at some point. I mean, we've talked to we've mentioned it from time to time, and I've even gotten questions from listeners about why this matters. Yeah. Um, but we've added uh, in the last two months five trillion dollars. To, that's to 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 trillion dollars to the debt. You're right. There hasn't been any mention of that anywhere, really. I hadn't mm-hmm. really looked it up to see kind of where the debt clock was at. Yeah. But um, it's at like twenty six point something now. Wow. Twenty six point man. something trillion. Um, I remember when it was just in the billions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There was a time. <laughs> you know. Well, and they made a huge deal out of it in the 1930s, like when FDR yeah. took over, one of his big platforms was that he was going to balance the budget and bring the debt down. The debt at the time was like $3 billion. Right. <laughs> right? And that was, that was scary yeah. to them then. Of right. course, he didn't do that. He raised, he blew it yeah, more up. Yeah. Right? I mean, he took over during the depression and, yeah. um, and that's when we really kind of brought the Keynesian style economics where you well, we'll just of print and government. borrow and yeah. government's going to give out jobs, have yeah. people digging holes and filling them. And, and uh, yeah, so the government interference, I think it can be reasonably argued led at that time to the, to the longest and deepest depression that had ever been experienced in this country. Yeah. Um, but like I said, we'll spend, we'll spend more time on It'd that. It'd be some other fun time. to do a, a podcast on that. We need to do that one time. Yeah. One day. I, someday I will finish The Great Depression by Rothbard. Oh, yeah? That, that's, a, that's a heavy read. Is it? Uh, it is. And yeah. I have limited time to read, and so I, I kind of like to read things that are a bit more fun, even though I don't really read any fiction anymore. Yeah. Um, I mean, but I'm, I'm reading uh, the... Uh, oh, gosh. I forget what it's called now. Uh, <laughs> obviously, I'm paying... Great attention to it. <laughs> right. um, You're absorbing that book, right? Yeah. Well, I am. It's about the uh, the terror war. Oh, okay. Um, it, it's Max Blumenthal's book, uh, Management of Savagery. Oh, okay. That's it. And I'm really, I, like, I'm loving it. It's yeah. it's a really interesting book, but it doesn't really have anything to do with the Great Depression. Yeah. Well, um, it does relate to the debt sum, though. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as we've spent six and a half trillion dollars, roughly, on the terror war in the last 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so that's part of it. But yeah, we spent six and a half, and like, and we complain about the expense of the wars. We spent six and a half trillion dollars on the terror war in the last 20 years. Um, we have raised the debt five trillion dollars in the last two months. Yeah. I mean, that just, that just feels like that's a, 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 a clock that's ticking that, that's just something's going to have to happen there. Like, uh, well, we have to fight the modern monetary theory that debts don't matter. Yeah, well, that's the. There's a lot of people that believe that, and they make a. They try, I, I don't know. They make an argument for it. I don't really. I don't think they make a good case. I think it's a. It's a belief for convenience because well, you uh, don't want to accept that. <laughs> here's here's that what a lot this of this is irrecoverable. To me, a lot of it relies on the fact that well, we don't really know that any of this is going to matter in the modern mm-hmm. era. Yeah. So. Like, we don't know. Yeah. <laughs> like, I think I saw a statistic, and I, I may be off by an order of magnitude here. Like, that's yeah. that's how bad it is. But I'm going to go on the low end. Okay. So if you hear this and it ends up being wrong, well, I'll just explain it at the end. Um, it's something like if we paid off the debt at $1,000 a second, yeah, uh, that it would a- take 800 years to pay off the debt <laughs> if it didn't grow anymore. Yeah. And like I said, I may be off by an order of magnitude, so it may have been eight thousand years right. at a thousand dollars a second. But oh. I think it was eight hundred. Yeah. Um, and still, that's insane, though. Yeah. It's ridiculous. I mean, there's 
And this may be a stupid question, but I have to ask. Does that much money even like exist in the system? Uh, like, is there a way to produce that much money to pay that? Oh, yeah, just print it. <laughs> well, obviously, like beyond just printing it. Like, yeah. I mean, there's, yeah, that's just, I don't know. It's just hard to imagine that type of, mm -hmm. of money. Yeah, um, well, it's because it doesn't really exist. Like, that kind of wealth can exist, but not the way that they're doing it. Yeah. Um, because, as we've discussed before, currency is not wealth. Yeah. Um, currency is a representation of wealth, but the value of the currency is dependent on how much wealth is actually in the system. Yeah. And, and wealth is produced through uh, innovation, through increased productivity. Yeah. Um, or frankly, by just finding natural resources too. Like, uh, but yeah. that's, that's again, innovation. Like how do you access resources that you weren't able to access before? Yeah. Um, like we've done with oil. Remember peak oil oh, 30 yeah. years ago or whatever. Well, now we've got better technology and we're able to access Fracking more oil and, than yeah. we could before. Um, we can go deeper. We can get into places that we couldn't before. Um, now, you can discover a huge gold vein or, or something like that. Have you a know? gold meteor crash yeah. into one of the oceans um, or and something. And suddenly there's a, a, there's a whole lot of wealth injected into the system. Well, I mean, even if a gold meteor crashed into the ocean, you still have to extract it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, it's it's labor converted into productivity or something of of intrinsic value yeah um that's where wealth actually comes from if you're not if you're not increasing productivity then adding more money into the system doesn't actually produce any additional wealth yeah. i mean it does at the beginning because it's before inflation adjusts for that extra money that's not represented by anything yeah. and this is one of those problems and you're letting me go down this rabbit hole I but am. My bad. um but you know that's one of these problems with the system as we have it uh, with the Federal Reserve System, uh, essentially, yeah. or with government-controlled currency in the way that it is, um, is that the it's the elites that get the value from it first. And so they get to take this money while it still has essentially its full value before the inflation takes hold. By the time it trickles down to us poor schmoes, um, it has lost its value. It's, uh, you know, inflation has adjusted to the addition of currency without the addition of wealth. Yeah. And so... And... You know, this, there's this is going on right now. This is one of those things that we predicted when they said, "Oh, well, we're going to you know provide all these loans and everything to businesses and inject money into the system and send checks out to people and all that stuff." And the things that we said were going to happen is what happened. Is that um, it ended up being a, a whole bunch of politically connected and already wealthy groups that got to benefit the most from those. Um, those creations of money. Yeah. Um, so, you know, people took advantage of the system. There was very little check on what was, like, where the money was actually going, um, who was getting to receive that stuff. And so there's tons of reports of, you know, businesses connected with um, government, uh, like federal government employees, uh, including like Nancy Pelosi's husband's business and, you know, all of these groups that collected on these small business loans, yeah. um, th you know, this free money that they put out into the system. And eventually it's going to catch up. Like there will be an inflation as uh, oh, in, yeah. in response to this. Um, and so it didn't help consumers in any way. Yeah. Just and makes that, your money worth less. Yeah, that $1,200 they sent you, by the time you got it, it was only worth 1000 yeah. And, you know, by the time you spent it, it was only worth 800 And if you decided to save it, then, well, that was a mistake. Yeah. Um, you should just <laughs> go ahead and spend it. Yeah. Buy a car. Buy something that, well, no, that's not a good choice. Cause car is not a good choice. I was fixing to say. That yeah. loses value. Too. Buy gold. Yeah. Oh, yeah, gold's only going to go up, I would imagine. Yeah. I mean, we're seeing a little bit of a recovery in the market when people are comfortable with the where the market's going, they'll get out of gold. Yeah. Um, I, uh, somebody was talking to me recently and that he was telling me that he's got a bunch of, uh, friends that are investors that are expecting gold to drop back down to like 1425. I really? said, man, if it gets back under 1500, I'm buying back in. Yeah. Um, you know, cause in the long run, I expect it'll be yeah. over 2000. I mean, it can only go. Yeah. It's, it's something that has actual value though. Yeah. It had actual value before it was so useful um, in electronics and so forth. Yeah. Uh, you know, before we had electrical things where it's conductivity 
was really helpful. Like yeah. it was valuable when it was just pretty and it didn't tarnish. It. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, and it was easy to work. Yeah. Uh, you know, now it has like technological reasons to be used, and so it has even more value than it did before. Safe investment. We all, we all know I'm a gold bug. <laughs> You're a gold bug. We know. <laughs> um, but you know this this debt really matters, and uh, the. You know, right now the Federal Reserve is buying bonds in big companies to keep them afloat. Yeah, that's yeah <laughs> recipe for disaster. Yeah. Um, and it, essentially, they're taking it out of your pocket one way or the other. Yeah. When the Fed prints money, they take it out of your pocket through inflation. When they borrow money, they're taking it out of your pocket. Well, really, again through inflation or through um, you know debt service in the long run. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, a lot of that is directly related to the lockdown and the the government enforced shutdown of the economy in so many ways. Yeah. And um, so you know, there's your consequences to the economy already. Uh, if we move on to society, um, increased crime rates. Um, yeah. I've, actually, like dramatically increased. Crime I was going to say I've seen some statistics the other day. I don't remember specifically, but the rates are like way high right now. Yeah. Like in a bunch of categories. Yeah. And, well, yeah, including violent crimes. Yeah. Um, now, part of it is, uh, you know, these pro well, not the protests, the the rioting and looting that happened alongside the protests. Yeah. Um, and even that, I would attribute though to the to the lockdown in a lot of ways. It's the only game in town. There's no sports. The well, people are all out of work. They're not in school. They, you know, they, well, <laughs> they don't have anything we, else to do. I think we talked about that at one point. Is like a lot of those people out there were just kind of larping anyway, just yeah. kind of like you know, oh, this is this is something to do. I need to get out of the house, and and it's something that you know, it's some there's something to believe in there. I mean, you know, there's there's nothing wrong with like Walton equal justice under the law like I don't, oh, yeah. I don't like people being killed by cops like <laughs> yeah or anybody else for that matter yeah well exactly so um i particularly don't like people being killed by people that never get held to account that's really kind of the issue with the police yeah um but yeah uh increased crime rates and violent crime robberies and so forth too and my response to that is well you know go back to step one like you put 40 million people out of work yeah, right. <laughs> you didn't think crime might increase? Absolutely. Like common sense. <laughs> you know, you got all the schools closed. Oh, but we cut them all these checks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they made more money stealing two TVs and when the looting happened than, right. than that $1,200 I'll take check. My, I'll take my checks and my two TVs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's an expectation. I think you got uh, people out of school. Um, so you got a bunch of teens with nowhere to be. Oh yeah. Um, you know, uh, sometimes without any real supervision. Um, so I, I think that that, that was expected. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it's not like expecting the unexpected. I mean, it, it should have been. Yeah. Yeah. That should have been factored in when they were making these decisions. Exactly. Um, there's uh increased domestic abuse, like yeah. uh, heavily increased domestic abuse. Um, here's the big one uh, that I've got an actual statistic for. Um, there has been a, a roughly 35% increase in ER visits uh, for child abuse. Oh, really? Yeah. Now, an ER visit, so there, it, it's not coming through any other way. It's just ER visits. But let me point out here that, and I used to work in, in the medical field. Yeah. ER visits for child abuse are severe problems. They yeah. They don't come in because they made some bruises or even like broken arm or whatever. Yeah. When parents that are abusing their children take their children to the ER, it's because they think they killed them. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's scary, man. You know, it's because they're unconscious and they can't wake them up and that kind of thing. It's it's yeah. generally really severe it's injuries. Serious, serious. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 35% increase. That's and a again, that comes back to, and I'm no advocate for public schools, but this yeah. is again, you know, back to a part of it is about schools being closed because the most common way that child abuse is discovered outside the home yeah. is from schools, teachers, uh, counselors, et cetera. Yeah. I knew that. That's insane. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I mean, I consider this a major consequence to society. These yeah. these are things that are that are important. 
Um, and you wanted to get to mental health. So what did you yeah. want to say about mental health before I get into this? I mean, I'd be interested to hear what you have to say, but I mean, it's just, it's just not healthy for people to be locked up like that and stay inside. Even with the, you know, with technology being what it is, it's just, it's, it's not the same as like person to person interaction. Yeah. And I, I, I can say I haven't really, I've worked through this whole thing. So like I hadn't really personally had to deal with that, but at least not to the level like what you have and what other people I know have, but it's just, it's not, it's not good for you. And it can cause you to start making bad decisions and just make you crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> people need social interaction. And, uh, I mean, you also have, you also have three other people in the house with you. I do. Yeah. And that helps. You got your wife to talk to you. You got your kids to talk to you. Yeah. When I'm locked at home, I'm home alone. Yeah. Oh Yeah. Like, um, that's not good, man. And I talk to myself plenty, yeah. but it's just not. <laughs> Got to have an intel intelligent conversation every yeah. now and then, right? <laughs> I like to deal with a better class of people. Right. Uh, <laughs> um, but, you know, and I've done Skype calls and things like that with friends, but it's, yeah. yeah and it's, all that stuff's good, but it's still not the same as, like, being face-to-face -face with somebody and yeah. getting that interaction, you know. Well, and we also have the issue potentially coming up in places like Austin and, and so forth where... Uh, you had people locked down, you let them out, and now you want to lock them down again? Yeah, and I think, so I've, and I've kind of believed this from the beginning, like the second wave of this may be a little more dicey, because mm -hmm. while the first time, and even, like, I'm the same way, like the first time around, I wasn't, I was opposed, once, like I said in the beginning, I was opposed to the government doing it, but I wasn't exactly opposed to people, like, locking down a little bit voluntarily. Yeah. Um, but... Now that we've kind of in the second round of this, you're gonna have more people like me that are like, "Oh yeah, I ain't doing yeah, this." Forget that. Yeah, yeah. You're gonna, you may have to, you're gonna have to force me. Like. Well, and, and in, uh, <laughs> I think it's Brooks County, Texas, they are arresting people that have tested positive that um, don't self isolate. That don't, yeah. And see, that's scary, mm -hmm. right there. I'm just saying. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, um, now I think that those people should self isolate. Like, if oh, absolutely. You've tested positive, you probably should stay home. Um, yeah. Well, just like with the flu or anything else, mm -hmm. I mean, like you don't want to go around spreading like virus or whatever, yeah. regardless of what it is. But at the same time, that's a whole nother stretch when you're allowing your government to take actions against people of in that way. Yeah. To take their liberty away. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and well, what if you got a bad test? I mean, you don't know. Yeah, I mean, and those things are definitely not proven to be entirely accurate. No. Uh, I, also, uh, they don't distinguish. So that's if you what I was fixing to say. Yep, yep. Um, it picks it'll it up. Come up too. Yeah, I mean, exactly. I, th I think that there are some tests that do distinguish, but that's not the common. But not all of them yeah. do. There's, there's, they're using a bunch of different type of tests, and there are definitely <laughs> some that'll pick up any coronavirus. Yeah. And not. I think the majority will pick up any coronavirus. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. Um. Well, and even in places like Texas where they're in Florida, like they're going after the states that opened up. Yeah. Right. Um, the uh, even in places like Texas and Florida and so forth, they're um, they don't compare at all to the states that have had the worst of this, the New York, New Jersey um, type places. So like New York and New Jersey have like 16 to 1700 deaths per million residents or something like that. Really? And Texas and Florida are like less than 200, I think. Wow. So, you know, they're making a huge deal about the second wave, but yeah. truthfully, those states compare very well to the... Which is why in the, when you watch the media, they're not really reporting on the deaths anymore. It's mm -hmm. all about increased cases. That's, that's the drum I kept hearing beat the other day. Increased yeah. cases, increased cases. Yeah. Well, and there, I mean, there is some evidence to suggest that it's spreading through the population pretty quickly uh, again. Yeah. Um, but, you know, there's also a lot more testing going on. Like yeah. the testing has, the you know, the daily testing has gone up by like 50% or something like that. Yeah. Uh, over just a month ago. Which is why I think, because there's a big, big deal being made right now. Like the U.S. has the most cases and blah, blah, blah. But I don't I, think that's true. I think India or 
and and I think India has the most total cases. Do they? And um, I think Indonesia is the one where it's uh, where it's going up the fastest. Is it right? Um, you're talking about that we had 55 or 60,000 new cases yesterday or something like that yeah, in the U.S. Yeah, that's what they were saying. Um, they had like 80,000 new cases in Indonesia yesterday. Really? Yeah. Wow. So... Um, I mean, we're still we're still not but, the worst of it, and our, still our mortality rate is below way low, below a lot of countries that claimed that are claiming or that they're holding up to be you know like bastions of the great control, yeah. um, like France. Um, I yeah. mean, we're we're like twenty five or thirty percent lower mortality rate per capita than France. Yeah. Um, but France is being held up. By, well, they lock things down really quickly <laughs> and they've kept them locked down. And, yeah. you know, they have all these rules about how people interact with each other and how far apart they stay and whether they wear masks and so forth. But it, it hasn't, I mean, the, the case rate isn't uh, significantly different from the U S and the mortality rate is worse. Yeah. Well, see, there you go. <laughs> Um, the reason they're held up that way, though, is just because that's what that's what the the government that's what the the powers that be that's the narrative that they want to put out there is that that all of this giving up your liberty is is such a noble thing, mm -hmm. um, and that's really that's what this is all about. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, I think it's a it's a test of how far can we push. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yep. Um, and I, I think that these the riots and protests are showing what the limits are. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Even though it's about something else. Yeah. I mean, I think that it's... Yeah, it's still people in the streets, man. Mm -hmm. I think it's a symptom. Yeah. Um, now, uh, back to that mental health issue when we want to get into statistics. Um, now, it's, it's hard to really gauge some of this stuff. So uh, there are some studies that suggest that the suicide rates are up like 400%. Wow, really? Um, and, of course, uh, we reported earlier, or it may have been one of the ones that I did alone, but um, reported earlier on the podcast anyway, um, that in uh, in some places in California, they were uh, reporting that they had had as many um, suicides in uh, admitted, um, or admitted through the morgue, I guess, essentially, but um, yeah. they've had a, they'd had as many suicide deaths uh, in the la in the previous four weeks as they'd had um, as they usually had in a year. Yeah. Well, and that, that doesn't surprise me. That's not something, I mean, mm -hmm. I think, I don't know if I was on the podcast with you or not, but I know we discussed that at the beginning of this, that, mm -hmm. that was, that's something you kind of have to weigh when you're talking about locking people down. Yeah. I mean, at that time they were reporting that they had more suicide deaths than coronavirus deaths. Yeah. Yeah. That's, and we locked down because of the virus. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, and the result was more suicides. Yeah. Um, there's uh, been an increase in drug overdoses. I couldn't get any firm numbers on how much that increase is, so it could be you know five percent. Who knows? Yeah. But there is an increase in drug overdoses. Um, there's been a, a ten percent increase in prescriptions for anti-anxiety and antidepressants. Yeah, um, which we're all, which are already overprescribed in this country. Yeah, that's um, that's scary. <laughs> yeah, but that's one in ten extra people. Yeah. Um, that's now on um, either an anti-anxiety or antidepressant drugs. Um, then you know, then you get into some polling, which I don't have a whole lot of faith in. But if the numbers are big enough, it does suggest a trend. Yeah. Anyway, um, and so uh, you had some polling by the, I think it's the American Psychiatric Association or whatever that thing's called um, that said that there was uh, greater than a third of Americans um, say that that the uh, coronavirus lockdowns have had a quote serious impact end quote on their mental health. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's self ascribed, but yeah. Um, you know, th a third, that's a lot. Like, that's a big <laughs> yeah. number. Yeah. Um, and then nearly half of parents, um, nearly half of parents who had children that were living in the house. So 18 and younger, yeah. um, living in the house, uh, rated their pandemic related stress levels at eight, nine or 10 on a 10 point scale. Yeah. Um, yeah, I can vouch for that. Like I got two kids. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, well, I, like I said, I hadn't really experienced the lockdown like a lot of people have, but I can imagine, yeah. <laughs> like I, I can picture it. <laughs> yeah. Well, and the, you know, the serious impact on mental health, a third of Americans saying that it's had a serious impact on their mental health. 
um, that goes along with uh, uh, a roughly 30% increase in uh, suicide hotline calls. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's something you can track. Yeah. Um, I mean, and there is about a 30% increase in suicide hotline calls. Yeah. So I wasn't just throwing that out. Yeah, no, but I'm just saying like, <laughs> yeah, but that's like a solid thing that you can track. Like mm-hmm. that's not like a poll or anything. Like, yeah. Yeah, these, these phone calls went up during this time period, mm-hmm. which only, I mean, it supports the thesis. You yeah. Know? Um, and they had about a 15% increase in um, finance-related uh, phone calls. Like people oh, yeah. just worried about finances, worried about becoming homeless, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and both of those, uh, the suicide calls and the finance-related like depression-type calls, um, mm. were uh, at all-time highs. Yeah. I mean, they'd have to be. I mean— you know. Well, and the truth is that if you suffer from one of, you know, one of these problems, even if it's, if it's mild depression, like you sit at home alone with nothing to do, you got a lot of time to think about how terrible things are. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. It, it's a lot harder to get out of the, that, the that cycle yeah. of, of depression when you don't have an outlet, like, yeah. or any, anything else to distract you from it. Oh, Absolutely. Um, so, uh, yeah, this is <clears throat> the point being, I suppose that you've got to weigh the, it, it's the unintended qu- consequences. It's the well, whole scene and unseen and thing again. Like, a, like we were saying, like you, you have to, when you're going to force people into a lockdown, all of that stuff should have been weighed versus what the mortality rate of this virus is, you know? Um, and the fact that this this virus isn't a death sentence if you catch it, kind of, you know, is all of this worth it? 0.26% according to the CDC data. Yeah. I mean, that's that's not worth <clears throat> what we've, what, worth everything we've just listed off here. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just not. Yeah. And the, the, the uh, mortality rate for people under 45 is almost zero. Yeah. I mean that's that's what I've understood. and that's the majority of your workforce. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> so um, it, that have been forcibly. Yeah, and that's really the thing. Like I, like I say, if if people choose to to quarantine and lock themselves in, that, and that's one thing. But it's it's different to have it mandated. Mm-hmm. Well, and you know, like like I said, part of this is the like a the. Moral here is the whole Bastiat seen and unseen thing. It's yeah. the, the un- unintended consequences of government action um, yeah. in this case. And, um, <clears throat> and the results that are being kind of ignored. Um, no kind of about it. Like, I mean, they're being ignored pretty hard from what I can tell. Yeah. Um, including the, the mounting evidence that the lockdowns don't really have an impact on the spread. Yeah. Um, but, uh, Milton Friedman used to say something like um, that uh, they spend a whole they they spend too much time focusing on um, the intended results of uh, government policy than the actual results. Yeah. All right. Mm. Well, and there's just so much you can't factor in when you're making these decisions anyway. Like, yeah. That's that's what you should be focusing on is how mm. all this played out in real time. <laughs> yeah. And wouldn't it have made more sense to let localities make their own decisions, which is what we advocate all the time. Like yeah. let, let Baldwin County or the city of Daphne decide for itself. There's no reason to have the federal government lock down Daphne that, um, you know, uh, your wife uh, works as a nurse, says that they've done hundreds of coronavirus tests and they've had four positive results very, or something. Very, few. very, um, very few. There's no reason for the federal government to lock down Daphne that's had uh, essentially you know, like very, very, very few cases yeah. um, because New York City has had so many. Exactly. It, it just, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Um, you and, can't take a top-down approach with something like this. I mean, and You that's, can't take a top-down approach with anything is well, the no. point that I would make. Oh, absolutely. I agree with that. But um, And that's like Trump right now is really pushing hard for the schools to open up, mm-hmm. which, you know, I'm. you can believe that what you, you can feel however you want to feel about that. But at the end of the day, he shouldn't be making that decision. Yeah, the individual for, school boards should. Yeah, those, those decisions should be made in those locations, mm-hmm. you know. Well, and that leads us to the the quote that I wanted to give for today, and we can kind of close it up after that um, because it's getting warm in here and I'm kind of sweaty. It is Uh, definitely (laughs) warm in here. um, We'll be fixed soon, hopefully. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, We'll see. Um, 
but and this is from and you know I like to quote Hayek uh, anyway. Um, he he's I don't know he's just he's good. Um, so uh, Friedrich Hayek when he won the Nobel Prize for Economics in the mid seventies sometime and he gave his acceptance speech. This is an excerpt from his acceptance speech, and it goes along with this particular situation and then so many things that we promote on this podcast that I thought that this was a good one for today, oh. um, and I'm glad I have it written down. Nice. Yeah, because it looks long from here. It is long. (laughs) Um, He said, uh, The recognition of the insuperable limits to his knowledge ought indeed to teach the student of society a lesson of humility, which should guard him against becoming an accomplice in men's fatal striving to control society. A striving which makes him not only a tyrant over his fellows, but which may well make him the destroyer of a civilization which no brain has designed, but which has grown from the free efforts of millions of individuals. Awesome. Yeah. Um, and so it's, it's that point that those people making those decisions don't have, they're not omnipotent. They yeah. don't have full knowledge of the situation at every level. Yeah. That they're not in a position to make a decision for everybody. Um, and that, uh, you know, and even if they were in that position, that it might be morally questionable in the sense that um, that you become a tyrant over the people that you're making decisions for. Absolutely. That you're taking decisions away from. That's maybe a That's better way really, to, yeah. to, to look at it. Yeah. Um, and the, you know, the thing that we talk about with a free market all the time, that he, he applies to civilization as a whole here, which hasn't been designed by any one or group of individuals that were, you know, directing it in any way, yeah. but has actually been created by the individual choices of millions and millions of people. Yeah. Yeah. You can't just omnip you just can't control something like that. Yeah. You just you have to let it do what it's gonna do. Mm-hmm. You know. Um and so uh, as always, you know, we we advocate here personal liberty, free enterprise and self government. Absolutely. And and all of those things are captured in this quote. And all of those things are are illustrated in the debacle that this coronavirus reaction by the government has has been. Oh yeah. Um but once again that's not to say that another government would have done a better job because yeah. I just don't think that they could do anything about this. Yeah. I don't think that there's government action at at really any level that could do anything more than than mildly mitigate yeah. Um, the, the results of, a of a virus Yeah. or any kind of illness like that. Yeah. It's true. I mean, I just, I, there's some things you just can't control. That feels like kind of a downer to end on, but I don't really <laughs> think that it is. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, just, uh, well, it's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, you know, I mean, I'm kind of glad the government can't control some of these outcomes. Yeah. Like, I mean, would you really want your government and to be able to control some of these things? <laughs> well, and the illustration is that's the reason that government should be limited. Um, that as much as they want to convince you that they have power over this stuff, that they don't. And so you're better off with the better option anyway, which is to be able to make your own choices about your life, which is freedom. what you're willing to risk. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Um, and so uh, we'll we'll go ahead and close it up there. It, you know, we're we yeah. got a nice short one so that we can get the fan running again. <laughs> right. Looking forward to some air conditioning. <laughs> well, the air conditioner is running. It's just yeah, it's not keeping it's out. not moving around enough in here without the fan on. Um. So uh, yeah, we'll be we expect to be back in a week. Yeah, it'll either be Thursday or Friday. Need to look at the calendar and figure it out. Okay. Um, we're gonna get back to Thursday soon, but um. I might have one more week of softball. Okay. So even though I totally skipped out tonight, although I may still catch it, I've got I've actually in pretty good shape to catch the game tonight. So I get to do both. I did yeah. a podcast and the softball. Yeah, Look that at frees me. You, that frees you up another week to skip softball. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, in that case, uh, you know, follow us on Facebook, subscribe on iTunes or Podbean, where you can find us. Um, mm-hmm. You know, keep an eye on the website. I'm about to start making some changes because I got some bad news about how we're putting the podcasts up. I mean, it's not bad news exactly, but it it seems to be something that's going to generate a bunch of work for me to try and fix things in a way. Well, I don't know. We'll see what happens. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm super lazy about it, so I may just start doing things differently going forward and leaving the old stuff the way it is. <laughs> don't know yet. Um, um, and again, 
put the call out there. Any of you people that are interested in helping out that know WordPress, um, could you use a hand. Yeah, I, I could definitely use a hand. Like I've learned quite a bit since I got this thing started, but I am no master at this stuff and I have a limited amount of time to l- learn new things. Yeah. Um, and a lot of that time is spent learning new things that I can tell you on this podcast. So it would be nice if you repaid the favor a little bit and <laughs> helped me with the website. Uh, you can contact me at Michael at the Liberty Mike.com to uh, offer your, your services. Absolutely. And I would be happy to get some emails. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so, at, you know, join us in a week when we finally get this right. And in the meantime, try and stay free. Life's short. Live free. Ciao. Later. Mm-hmm.